Yes, thank you for that precious choral anthem by Rosanna Choir. And it's already the second Lord's Day in the last month of this year. 2023, 2023 is almost at its end. And at this point in time, when we look back upon the year and we wrap things up and settle our accounts, it's that time of year. And in today's scripture reading, in Psalm 73, 28, it reads, The nearness of God is my God, or is my good. This was the psalmist's confession. And it's not one that just came out. But up until he was able to confess this, the psalmist went through many experiences, prayed many prayers. It's a very precious confession. And the psalmist saw, listened, contemplated. And we can see this through Psalm 73. And the content of Psalm 73 is the dilemma that we as human beings experience. And I empathize a lot with Psalm 73 as I read it, and I'd like to go through it verse by verse with our saints today. So today we'll focus on Psalm 73 and if there are any parts where you also say oh it was like that for me too I pray that we will all have an understanding so let us go visit into Psalm 73 so if we read Psalm 73 verses 1 through 2 Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling, my steps had almost slipped. These verses come from the knowledge that God is good but to know and to actually experience is there's a great difference and because of that difference this psalmist almost came close to stumbling and slipping what's next in Psalm 73 3 for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked God is this God and knowing that we looked around us but huh people who don't believe in God who don't even know God even people who wag their fingers at God everything is working out for them they're prospering And we think, huh, everything is going so well in their lives despite the way that they're living. And what what was the psalmist envious of? Psalm 73 verses 4 to 9. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. We would restrain ourselves as we are punished after sinning, but there is nothing like that. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. So because they are rich and wealthy, their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. So 
So things go so well for them, far beyond their imagination. They don't even know how much they're making. So they look down on others. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. Verse 9 They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Verse 9 is translated in the New Living Translation as they boast against the very heavens and their words strut throughout the earth. Oh, I don't need God. I believe in myself. I can do it. What God is there? It translates the latter half as their words strut throughout the earth. That's the kind of people they are. So why do things work out for them? How come everything goes so well for them? They make more money than I do. They amass more riches. And this is the present time, what Psalm 73 speaks of. And we witness this with our own eyes. And the psalmist, as he saw this, he said, Oh, God is exact. What is this? And the wicked are like so. And Psalm 73 10 says, Therefore his people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them. His people, who does this refer to? It's easier to understand it by looking at a different translation. The New Living Translation reads, and, and so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. So the psalmist, seeing these people's wealth and prosperity, was, em was envious. And not only that psalmist, but in the Korean translation, it reads that the people of God were drinking in the same words as the wicked. Also in the New American Bible Revised Edition, so my people, so my people in God's voice, turn to them and drink deeply of their words. Even the people of God who say they believe see the people of the world being successful and prospering and they fell to their ways. Why? Because they grew envious of one, two, three, ten things of how they were able to enjoy what they had. Oh, I want to be like that. What is the reason why we receive the word? That we live a life of faith to go to heaven? Ultimately, yes. However, the kingdom of heaven is not just going into it immediately. It's a journey. And while we're journeying, we change. The journey to the kingdom of heaven, on that journey, they hear the word of God. They become one with the word of God. And as they do so, they change. So the multitudes become saints. And saints have a different value system. Some people put or value these things the most, whether it's money, or living well. But the values of saints are different. If our values are the same as those who 
As the same as those of worldly people, no matter how much we have heard the word, we will fall and listen to their words, fall to their ways, and drink of their same waters. And this is also described in Revelation 17, verses 1 through 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And what does the great harlot do? She always tempts, lures. And the great harlot is the one who rules on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality, meaning that they were lured and fell to temptation of her immorality. They were so envious because it looks so nice. I'll take a bite, you take a bite. They drank the same worldly waters and spoke the same as the people of the world. Psalm 73, 11. So even the people of God drink of the same waters as the people of the world. In verse 11, they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? And the, the NIV translation reads, they say, how would God know? Uh, I don't know if God exists because even the wicked, all goes well for them. How would God know? Does the Most High know anything? Who's saying these words? The people of God who claim to believe in God. There's no change in my life. Even if I stray just a little bit, I'm, I'm not punished. There's no accidents or no one's sick. I don't think God knows. How would he know? So they drink of the wine of the great harlot and the people of God are saying the same words as the people of the world. Psalm 73, 12. Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease they have increased in wealth. So would they disregard God then? Yes. God doesn't know. If I just stray a little bit and straddle both worlds, we feel pierced at first, but Nothing happens. All is at peace. And we think, oh, God doesn't notice. Psalm 73, 12 in the New Living Translation reads, Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease. And so these wicked people refer to the people who are originally wicked and also includes the, pe the former people of God. They're enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. So God's people who are straddling both worlds, they grow confident. Mm, things are working out. Next, in Psalm 73 verses 13 through 16. Surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. This is what the psalmist is saying now. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. 
It's a bit difficult to understand, isn't it? The New Living Translation will read the same passage. Did I keep my heart? So both the wicked and the people of God are enjoying life without God. And seeing that, the psalmist says, Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? Even though they fell to temptation, I did not. But seeing myself, it looks like it's all for nothing. I look like the fool. I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand because the psalmist couldn't understand why am I like this but everyone else is doing well. Though he tried to understand but what a difficult task it is. He cannot understand. God, you're the God of righteousness and justice. People who claim to believe are straddling both worlds and doing well. I just look, I'm the one who looks like a fool. I strive to live according to the word without straying to the right or the left, but nothing gets better. It seems like God is only troubling me. How come my problems aren't resolved? Why do I have more problems every day? Why does he test me? And a part of a, a part of him wonders Should I try living like them? But the word in the psalmist doesn't allow him to do that. But it's too difficult to understand. And so we've gone over the psalmist's dilemma, but have you ever wondered this? Where everybody else seems to be doing well except for me. And if we simply sympathize and say, oh, poor psalmist, he must have had a hard time. But what if it's my experience? What if it was my life? Because it's actually happening to me. Living according to the word of God is not easy because we have our children to think of. We have to support and provide for our family. Because not only do we have to do our work, but we also, and we, in addition to God's work, and we're limited in our energy, in our resources, and even while we're trying to do both, we're criticized, and that's why it's so hard. I just want to live a comfortable life. But, we can't go to the other side. The psalmist has a sure standard, a sure wall in him. Even though he thinks for a second, oh, should I try? And then he goes, no. It's that wall. And he has that standard. But the problem remains. Why do the wicked prosper more than the people of God? When will when is this issue resolved? Psalm seventy three seventeen, and this is where our the title of today's message comes from. 
until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Who does their refer to? All those people we were envious of who were prospering. And let's look at the New Living Translation of this verse. Then I went into your sanctuary, O God. And I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Up until he entered into the sanctuary, this problem remained, was unresolved. But he, he finally understands after he entered the sanctuary. So what is outside of the sanctuary? We've learned of Moses' tabernacle, haven't we? We're learning about it in the Wednesday services. So when they enter through the gate of the sanctuary or of the, of the tabernacle, they come to the altar burnt offering and they wash their hands in the laver and then they go into the holy place. So is the sanctuary the world? No. Because it's the courtyard, the outside of the holy place is the courtyard of the tabernacle. And the altar burnt offering is where our sins are resolved through the burnt offerings that are given on it. But even in the courtyard of the tabernacle, the issue remains. It was only when he went into the sanctuary We can't, cannot understand when we're in the courtyard of the tabernacle. Is the light of the tabernacle outside of it the same as the light inside? No, they're different because outside, is, the light is a sunlight. But inside the tabernacle, inside the holy place, holy place it would be dark because of the four layers of coverings that over it. But it's the lampstand that gives light inside the holy place, inside the tabernacle. So the lampstand illumines inside the tabernacle. So the light is different. In 1 Peter 2.9, Apostle Paul says, but you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Who, is, who does you refer to? Those who have received the gospel, who follow it, it's not by bloodline, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And is this marvelous light referring to the sunlight? No. so that we can proclaim the excellencies of Him. The sanctuary can only be entered by priests, and the sanctuary has to be entered to know and understand through the marvelous light in the sanctuary. And that's what the psalmist realized when he entered the sanctuary of God. What did he realize? Psalm 73 verses 18 through 20. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction how they are destroyed in a moment. 
they are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. The people who are living the high life are now, have now slipped. And like a dream, when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. The psalmist is comparing them to a dream. Everything's going well for them. They're prospering, successful. Oh, it's like a, sh a brief dream. And there's a saying where life is but a dream. When we feel the warm sunlight, on a spring day, we fall asleep, and that's what life is like, a brief dream. All the things that happen in a dream, whether good or bad, end when one wakes up. If in our dreams we were suffering or being chased, and even in the dreams, we think, oh, I wish this were a dream. And we wake up from that nightmare. We breathe a sigh of relief. It all ends when we wake up. It's futile, that dream. So no matter how much we may have, or no matter how much people have in their bank accounts, no matter what life they're living, it all ends when they wake up from a dream. So no one is envious of a person who dreams. And after understanding this, the psalmist continues in Psalm 73, 21 verses 23. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. And this is always something I wondered about. I was... A part of my heart grumbled against God about. But then he realized that he was like a beast before God. The fact that I was envious of those people, the fact that I wavered thinking that I should try living like that. Despite all that, God upheld him through all that. And he was so pained by this that he was pierced in his heart. He was so sorry, and at the same time, so very thankful. Verses 24 and on. With your counsel, or with your word, you will guide me step by step. And afterward, receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. After entering to the sanctuary and having understanding through the marvelous light in the sanctuary, the psalmist confesses that God is my portion. God, I want this. I want to try this. I want that to be my inheritance and I want to expand and grow. I want that to be my inheritance on earth. But that's no longer the psalmist's inheritance or portion, but it's, but God is his portion. And which tribe of the twelve tribes had God as their portion? It was the tribe of Levi. 
The tribe of Levi could confess that God is my everything. He's my inheritance. He's my portion. All the other tribes had their allotted land in Canaan. Only the tribe of Levi did not. God was their entire portion. And the tribe of Levi, as it, we read earlier, is that you are the royal priesthood. In Psalm 73, verses 27 through 28, For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. So there's, I'm not troubled by this anymore. I'm not envious of them anymore because I see their end. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. And to have arrived at the conclusion of verse 28, do you think the psalmist is envious of anything? No, he's not. He's, there's nothing he's envious of because the worldly blessings are not blessing. But to be with God is the truest blessing of blessings. Having understood this, the psalmist is making the sincere confession. In conclusion, the dilemma and worries that the psalmist had in Psalm 73 are things that most people can understand we live in this world so we can we can feel certain ways we can compare we can be envious we can be tempted we go through the same dilemma have the same concerns but the turning point is what is in Psalm 73, 17. Today's title, Until I Came Into the Sanctuary of God. The moment we experience the marvelous and amazing lights in the sanctuary, all our questions and doubts will disappear. Where were, we, where were we until then? We were in the courtyard of the tabernacle, which is still part of the tabernacle. We would always go to the altar of the burnt offering, repent for our sins every time we sin, go back and forth. But when we we're still at the altar of the burnt offering in the courtyard, there are still questions, still doubts. You're the God of righteousness and justice. You're said to be the God, or we're, you're the God of us. We're your people. But that is at the court of the tabernacle. An apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a royal priest. That is not an option, but an essential. We must become the royal priest. And when you become a royal priest, you must enter into the sanctuary. And once you enter, we must experience that 
indescribable, marvelous light. To understand, to realize, to know, to be unshaken and not tempted by the harlot who sits on the waters. Only then can we confess that the nearness of God is our good. So may all our, our saints in our respective places and positions, you've come to the right place. If there are things that we are sorry about and regret, may we once again pray, strive once more, and understand and realize that the nearness of God is my good. And His grace is what has kept us up until this point. And furthermore, if we have drawn near to God and then fallen away, drawn near to God and fall away, I pray that we would live a changed life like Enoch who walked with God. And I pray this blessing upon you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, full of love and grace, from January 1st, 2023, up until this very moment, whether we knew it or not, whether we understood it or not, you did not leave us for a second, but you are always with us, watching over us, that is how we've lived up until now. Father God, the psalmist dilemma in Psalm 73, where at times he envied and was jealous of the wicked who prospered, if that describes us and our hearts, We pray, or we've learned that the psalmist had understanding after he entered into the sanctuary and encountered the marvelous, marvelous light in the sanctuary. We pray that all the saints of Evergreen Hill Church, what we all cry out to you as one, is that we will not circle again and again the altar of burnt offering only but we pray that we would wash our hands and feet in the laver and become royal priests so that without exception we all enter into your sanctuary and lord would you grant our earnest plea and by so doing All the problems, concerns, and doubts, questions we ever had, would they all disappear before you so that we may, and would we confess out of realization how you have kept us and how the nearness of you is our good. And we pray that Every day, we would walk with you like Enoch to live a life that is pleasing to you. We believe it'll be as we've prayed, and we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, with thanksgiving. Amen.